but it's a question, who do you think you are? And the second question, in going a little bit deeper with that, with that, is who exactly are you? Who is it that you are on the inside that maybe most people don't know? Or even you don't even know yourself. Who are you? Who do you think you are? So if you could have the, the first, just a title slide up. Who do you think you are is the title of my message. And we live in a world is is damaged and it's broken and it's continuously being challenged. People everywhere are searching for significance and purpose, for meaning, for identity. People don't know who they are. And you only have to turn on a celebrity news channel on, on your sky or whatever, or pick up a one of those like, magazines that's like, OK or Hello magazine. And it's just full of celebrities doing things to try and find out who they are, to try and find some sort of purpose and meaning and identity. And you might have seen going around Facebook or social media, the Kylie Jenner challenge. Anyone that heard of the Kylie Jenner challenge? And looking around, people clearly haven't been doing it, which is a good thing. Because <laughs> Kylie, Kylie Jenner is this attractive um, girl, is part of the Kardashian extended family, and, and she's um, kind of celebrated for her perfect lips. She's got luscious, beautiful lips. And, and she's, she's a good looking girl. And some people wanted to get lips like her because, again, searching for identity. I want to be significant and mean and have meaning and be noticed and for people to think I'm beautiful. And so what, you, what they do, and I don't recommend doing this because it can leave um, bruising and cause your lips to bleed, but you get like a little thimble thing and, and you kind of suck it up and you, and you kind of, there's like a vacuum and you leave it on your mouth for a few moments and then you pull it off and you've got big lips. <laughs> And honestly, some of them are hilarious because the lips are like four times the size of what they should be when you're talking like that. <laughs> and, um, and they haven't got, I don't know what they've got, they haven't got Kylie Jenner lips after, at the end of it. But her dad is Bruce Jenner. Who's ever heard of Bruce Jenner? And famous in the 1970s for being the decathlon Olympic champion, won the gold for America, the 1976 Olympics. And... He then has married into the Kardashian clan and in, inherited all the attractive daughters and, and a beautiful wife. But he's more famous recently at the age of 65 for deciding that he wants to be a woman. And if you put the next slide, there's a photo of him in his prime. And that's a good looking guy. That is like, I want that physique. Please, Lord. If, if you want to ask something for Lord for this year, Lord, I want that physique. And to be slightly taller and tanned. And a flowing locks. So he's a good looking guy. He won the gold and he said that throughout his whole life he's felt like a woman. And he's felt that his true identity is as a woman. And I don't know about you, but I don't agree with that. I don't believe that God makes people who they are by mistake, that they've got a purpose and that if you're born a man, you are a man. And what really is going on there is is that symptom of a lack of identity, that broken image that can only ever be discovered in Jesus. And if you've seen the film Rocky, Rocky is he's Rocky Balboa and he's trying to find, um, he's trying to get himself fit for this fight and his wife asks him why does he drive himself so hard to, he punishes his, his body physically and, and himself mentally to get ready for this fight and, and she asks him why, why are you doing that for? And um, he says to her, then I'll know I'm not a bum. I know that I'm not a waste of space. I'll know that I'm, I mean something. And you get that even in that film, that he's striving for his image, for his identity, for, for significance and meaning. So who do you think you are? Who exactly are you? And you only have to flick through Facebook to see this, endem this is endemic even on Facebook. People are putting... Images on that they want people to see about themselves. Nobody puts a bad photo on unless you're putting a friend's photo on and they've caught out. But you're always looking for your best profile, your best side, or you only ever put on that you have had a great day. You never, I never put on, for example, just woke up this morning and the kids just done made in straight away. They came for a cuddling bed and wet, wet, their, wet our bed, or they've thrown their breakfast all over the table, but today's going to be a better day. You don't generally put that on, but you kind of celebrate the good stuff in life. And social media kind of projects 
It's a false image, really, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all want to kind of share good things about our life, but social media becomes this almost fake life where everything is rosy and perfect. But who do you think you are? And people put labels on themselves. You put, put the next slide on. People put labels on their life. And that is never your true identity. Your true identity is not how you look. Your true identity is not your sexual preference. Your true identity is not your job or your success, the car that you drive, or the girl that you have hanging off your arm. That is not your true identity. You can never f find who you are by what you do. What you do does not define who you are. But when you find out who you are, it will define what you do. And growing up, I, I, didn't, I struggled with my identity, knowing who I was. And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm an, an identical twin. I've got a twin called Michael who looks very similar to me. And if you saw him walking down Southport, you might think for a moment it was me. And growing up, that was hard because we were labelled as Mark and Michael. And the terrible twins, or the savages, <laughs> and, or just the twins, and, or Ronnie and Reggie, as in the craze. <laughs> and it was all right up until about 30, and then puberty kicks in, and you're trying to find out who you are. Puberty's in a horrible age where you're trying to, you're changing, you're trying to find out, um, as your voice changes, you kind of question who you are and all that sort of thing, and, and you kind of awaken to all sorts of things. And puberty's tough to try and find out who you are. And so from the age of 13, we kind of didn't like each other because we didn't want to be each other. And even in the womb, we kind of shared the womb. We shared clothes. I had blue shoes. He had red. And we shared a bedroom. We shared toys. And 13 was enough. I've had enough. I want to be me. And I can't speak for my brother, but I know he kind of had the same ideal, really, and the same desire to be an individual. And so growing up, as a teenager and into my early 20s, I didn't know who I was. And I had insecurities and doubts and fears, like I suppose most people do. And I wasn't brought up in a Christian house. I, I didn't go to church at all, so I didn't know anything about Jesus and my identity in him. For me, Jesus was a swear word, and Christians were people who were hypocritical and lived, said one thing but lived another thing, or they were... They'd had a breakdown somewhere, and so they needed something to believe in. That's what I genuinely, genuinely thought. And then I met Nicola, and met her family, and, and I knew that they were Christians. And when I met them the first time, I noticed that there was something different about them, that they had light shining out of their eyes. Their eyes were awake, and there's life in them. And it says, actually, you know, if you live out the word of God, then it, it revives the soul, it brings light to the eyes. And they were living out what they believed, and I saw something in them that was different. Something in the, in the way that they loved each other, the way that they... They lived out their faith. They weren't hypocrites, but they loved me even though they weren't overly keen on me because I was slightly older than Nicola and I lived a life that um, you wouldn't want your daughter getting involved in. Yet they still loved me. And six months down the line, Nicola's sister came back from mission. She's, now, she's an Ealing pastor now in Lancaster. But at the time, she was out on mission with Youth with a Mission, YWAM. And she'd been to South America, came back really on fire for Jesus and I was chatting to her in a nightclub and I'd had a bit to drink and, and I was drunk. And she was telling me about, about Jesus, that Jesus loved me, that he had a plan for my life, that he was real, that he wanted to get to know me. And, and something stirred in my heart. I got excited and, and I sobered up straight away. And I found just at how fake everybody was. People that I knew who would just be really quiet and, and kind of just get on with things in the normal life. If they've got drink or drugs in them, they were like the life and soul of the party. It was like life was all about them. And I thought, you know, that's so fake. And I realized how fake I was. And, and I said to myself, there's got to be more to life than this. And so the night after the Sunday night, I, I, I prayed to God. I said, God, if you're real, I want you to show yourself to me because I can't imagine that you're real. I can't believe myself into believing in you. So will you show yourself to me if you're real? And... That night, I had this most amazing encounter with God. And if you look at your hands now, it was, it was like that real to me. Because I go into bed and, and all I had was this dream. And, and I kind of woke up in this dream where I was looking at my hands. And all around me was darkness. And in the middle of this darkness was this fire. And it wasn't a hot fire. It wasn't making any noise. It was just a presence. And I now know that was God because God is you know, consuming fire. He's, he's represented in fire. But I didn't know that at the time, but this, this presence was there. And out of this fire was, was 
coming up, these bits of paper, and this paper was raining down. And I picked up three pieces of paper. One of them I unfolded and it said that he's coming. And I threw that away. The second one said he's the Emmanuel. And I threw that away. And the third one said, which fits into today, is it said even the dirtiest of crystals can be broken open to reveal the most beautiful of colour. Even the most dirtiest even the most dirtiest of crystals can be broken open to reveal the most beautiful of colour. And I woke up as soon as I read that one. And it was dead on time to get up for work. It was about three minutes past six. And I felt alive on the inside for the first time ever. Colours were brighter. I was excited. And I knew there was more to life. But in my head, I was going, that didn't just happen. But I knew it did because it had gone deeper. And that for two weeks, I said nothing. And then I had another, another dream where I was in these fields and it was blue sky and it was sunny. And this voice said to me, right, Mark, you can stay on this side of the wall. And I noticed this wall going as far and as, as far as I could see and as high as I could see. And he said, you can stay on this side of the wall where you, where you go, can go where you want, you can do what you want, and it's nice, but it doesn't last forever. Or you can go through this small gap. And I looked down, and there's a gap, probably as high as the, and wide as a chair. And this voice said, if you go through this gap, it can be difficult at times, it can be restricting, but when you get to the other side, it's even more beautiful than this side, and it goes on forever. And as soon as he said forever, I woke up, three minutes past six, again, knowing God has spoken to me. And so the next day, I gave my life to Jesus. Because I knew Jesus was real, but I didn't want to prepare to submit to his lordship and to make it real in my life. And that, for me, began a process of discovering who I was. That, that this dirty crystal that is me was going to be broken open to reveal the most beautiful colour that God had put inside. And God had ordained me for, had created me for. That God was going to reveal something in and out of my life. So that question again, who, who are you? Who do you say you are? Who do you think you are? We are made in God's image. You are more loved than you can ever realise. And I know we get, we get moments where we, where we sense God's love. And it's, there's nothing like it. And there's moments where God seems a million miles away. But the truth always is that you are made in God's image. You are loved by a heavenly Father who created you on purpose and with a purpose. And Psalm 139 reflects that, doesn't it? That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God's thoughts for us and towards us are innumerable. And the good and the perfect. So God's thoughts to you are not what, what mistakes you've made. God's thoughts towards you are not what you don't do for him. God's thoughts towards you are good and they're about you. So what is it that God says to you about who you are? Because I believe that God wants to unlock that in your life, that God wants to speak to you about who you are in him, about your identity. So if we're made in God's image, where did it all go wrong? And it's in Genesis that we read that. If you want to turn with me to Genesis 3, I'm going to read verses 1 to 18. So we're made in God's image, Everyone is looking for identity, but if we're made in the image of God and we have identity in him, why are we all so messed up? Why are we still being repaired from the inside out? So Genesis 3, verses 1 to 18. I'm going to read, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It'll be slightly different to yours, if you're NIV or whatever. And it says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of those trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And God did say you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. She believed the lie, didn't she? And she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it and then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. And so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breeze, breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so they hid, and they hid among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. And I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. And the key phrase there is, who told you that you were naked? And Adam and Eve, they're, 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 
the led into sin, they make that choice to disobey God. And it all begins with Satan challenging their image of God. That God somehow is holding something from them. He's challenging their perception of God as a good father. And so they begin to mistrust God. And as soon as you see God wrong, you begin to see yourself wrong. Because only when you see God right can you see yourself right. And so they're seeing God wrong for the first time. And they make that choice and they, and they take the fruit. And then their eyes are open to what they've done. And Satan, I believe, is the one that said that they were naked. He comes in with shame and with criticism and with, with a challenge on their identity. So their identity is broken. And that journey of humanity since is, is a story of broken identity. Because their identity of, with God was broken from that time onwards. They didn't see God right, and so they didn't see themselves right. And so we see throughout the whole of history the journey of self. People trying to find out who they are. People go to war to conquer other nations because they want to have meaning and significance. They want to have power and control. We see people um, with sexual sin trying to find meaning and significance. We see people who don't know who they are trying to reinvent themselves constantly because that identity is broken it's that journey of self that discovery of who they are but never getting to the destination and it's only in Jesus that we get to that destination of who we are so who said that you were naked who said that you're not good enough who said that you're nothing like God who said that you're a waste of space that you're nothing that you're going to achieve nothing in your life who said that it could be people it could be yourself, but the root of it all is, is the devil who wants to bring shame and who wants to destroy the image of God in our lives. You see, even when God came calling, Adam hit, he hid, he remained hidden. He'd lost the truth of who God was. He was now afraid of God. Instead of loving God and trusting him, being open with him, he, he was afraid of God. His image of God was distorted. And we see the image distorted between themselves. They're hiding their nakedness from each other. Where before they walked around unclothed and they were open-hearted towards each other, that now is divided between Adam and Eve. They are hid not only from God but from each other. And part of being healed in our identity is being healed with each other. It's being healed with God, with ourselves and with each other. And Tim Keller writes this. He is a pastor in New York but he's also um, a writer as well. And he says this, that sin is the despairing refusal to find your deepest identity in your relationship and service to God. Sin is seeking to become oneself, to get an identity apart from him. Most people think of sin primarily as breaking divine rules. But the very first of the Ten Commandments is to have no other gods before me. So according to the Bible, the primary way to define sin is not just doing bad things, but the making of good things into ultimate things seeking to establish a sense of self by making something else more central to your significance, purpose and happiness than your relationship to God. As we try and find our identity apart from God, that's sin because it's putting ourselves before God. As we try and find out who we are and it's apart from God, we are putting another God before God and that's ourselves. And so only your true identity can be found in God and if it's not, and it just leads to a real mess. And Romans touched on this in chapter 1. It says from verses 21 to 27 of Romans 1. And this is the message version. People knew God perfectly well. But when, when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines that you can buy at any roadside stand. So God said, in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. And it wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen, smeared with filth, filthy inside and out. And all this because they, they traded the true God for a fake God and worshipped the God they made instead of the God who made them, the God that we bless and the God who blesses us. But worse followed. Refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women and men didn't know how to be men. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women and men with men. All lust but no love. And then they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love. 
They were godless and loveless. And so that lack of identity in God leads to all sorts of horrendous stuff. Things that are evil and disgusting and broken. Because if your image is broken, your life will also be broken. But God wants to heal us up on the inside. He wants to heal our identity in him and heal who we are and how we see ourselves. And there's a, a, a saint in the 14th century in the name of Catherine of Siena. And she said this. She said, be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. And I don't know about you, but we're not really yet setting the world on fire, are we? We're not really seeing the world transformed by the true sons of God rising up in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing who they are and with the authority that God's given them and changing things because we don't yet know fully who we are. We're on a journey, I believe. As soon as you become a Christian, there's something about your identity get, that gets healed and you begin that journey of discovering who you are. But the only way you know more of who you are is by knowing God more. And as Christians, we can be so bad at reading our Bibles. We can be so bad at praying and worshipping and thinking about God that we're never discovering more. And so we kind of hit a plateau in identity and we never rise up to change the world because we're just nominal Christians or we drift and life gets the better of us. When the storms come, we're tossed to and fro instead of being anchored firmly in the rock of our salvation. And David begins to get awakened to that. He talks about it in Psalm 100. 139 but also in psalm 8 he says this that when i look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers the moon and the stars you set in place what are mere mortals that you should think about them human beings that you should care for them yet you made them only a little lower than god and crowned them with glory and honor you gave them charge of everything you made putting all things under their authority the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals the birds in the sky the fish in the sea and everything that swims the ocean currents so he's beginning to be awakened there to the true identity of humanity with who've got authority to change this world that adam and eve were given a mandate to subdue the earth to look after the animals to plant plant food and to to see whatever had been there that was not of God to push that back, to go out into the earth and subdue it, subdue it from its chaos and its disorder. Yet that was lost, wasn't it, with, the, with sin and with the fall, with that broken identity. But David is awakened to that. But there's nothing better than being awakened to that by Jesus. David did not have what we have. We have a greater um, experience of God than David ever had. David knew God and they had a heart after God, but we've got God living inside of us, not just to empower us for, for a mission, like David, he was anointed because he was king, he was anointed for a purpose, but we've got God in us who wants to transform us. David never had that transformation, yet he still recognised something of the identity that God had put in him and was trying to call out. Jesus said that he came to give his life and life to the full. And his cousin John writes in First John chapter 5, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And his life, this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son, he who does not have the son of God does not have life. We are awakened to life. We have got life in us that we never had before. If you're not a Christian, you don't have life. You're not awakened to the truth of who Jesus is, to that life that is in us. When I woke up that morning after that dream, I had life in me for the first time. It was awakened. And you can only be awakened to life first. But I believe that life awakens us to a journey of discovering life even more. Life in all its fullness. Because Jesus said he came to give us life and life to the full. I don't know about you, but I don't always experience life to the full. Sometimes life is a mess. Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes I don't like myself. Sometimes I don't believe in myself. But Jesus wants us to believe in who we are because he's given us an identity and a calling. We are made in his image. So God, would you awaken us with your life? Colossians 3 says um, that we have put on our new self, which is being renewed in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, f slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. We are a new creation. The old is gone. But we need to somehow learn to live in that new creation to put off the old self and continue to learn what it means to live in the new self. A self who is loved, who is cherished by a heavenly father, who is awakened to life. And it's a choice you've got to make. You can't just drift through life. I can't just drift through life thinking everything's sorted because it's not. I can't just think I'm saved and everything's all right because I want to awaken to my identity. I want to know what, what is it that God's put in me that I've not yet discovered. 
She never hides anything from us, but he hides things for us to discover in him. And your identity, the deepest part of who you are, can never be shaken. It can never be taken away. There's nothing can, that can separate you from the love of God. It might separate some of your choices, some of your material goods. It might separate your career from you. It might separate certain bad relationships from you, but it'll, it'll never separate you from him because who you are is unshakable and it's deep down and it's given to you by God. But most of us don't know yet who we fully are and we'll never fully realise that until we see him face to face. But I want to know more and more of who I am. I want to be confident in, in who I am and, and walk in that authority that is given us as sons and daughters of God because we need to set the world alight, don't we? We want to see the world transformed. It's not about having better meetings on a Sunday, but, but about having a better Southport and about having a better family and seeing God's culture come on earth instead of the culture affecting the church. We want to see the kingdom come, don't we, on earth as it is in heaven. So be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. You need to know who you are first. And there's so many wishy-washy Christians out there because they don't know who they are. And I don't want to be wishy-washy and I don't want to be someone who just gives up easily when life gets tough or gives up on God because things aren't always ideal or church doesn't play the songs I like so I'm giving up on church. You know, go to another church if that's what, what happens. But don't give up on God. Don't give up on discovering him in your life. And I love it how Jesus, he's affirmed in his identity. He knows who he is. And as a kid, he's in the, he's in the temple about age of, of about 12 and his parents have lost him and they go in there and he's there and he says, I'm, I'm in my father's house. He knows who his father is. He knows who he is. But when he gets baptized, he goes down in the, in the water at the age of 30, comes back out and the father says, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And he says it again upon the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter wants to build some kind of um, some buildings to celebrate and to kind of almost remain up there in that moment. But God speaks, this is my son whom, I'm, whom I love. And each time Jesus is affirmed in his identity so he can do what is right. He can go into the wilderness and face the devil and resist temptation because his identity is secure. He can come down from the Mount of Transfiguration and go to the cross because his identity is, is secure. It's not about him getting all the praise from the people or hanging out with Moses and Elijah forever up on that mountain. But actually he's got a purpose and that is secured because of his identity. He knows who he is. And Zephaniah 3, I, lo I love this. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible where it says that God rejoices over us with singing. What is God singing over your life? What is he singing to you about you? And too often we're saying, God, I want a purpose. God, what is it that you called, saved me for? And I spent years doing that. God, what am I going to do in my life? When really God wanted me to know who I was in him first. And that's the most important thing is, is discovering who you are in him. Discovering the heavenly father who loves you, but knowing that you're a son, you are forgiven and you are free. But what is it that God wants to break out of you? What is that he wants to shatter a few that is making you a dirty crystal? What is that most beautiful of colour that he wants to bring out of your life? And it's unique to you. I can't say what it is for you. I don't quite yet know who it is for me. But I want to love God and love people. And that's beautiful, isn't it? I want to love my wife better. I want to love my kids better. I want to, I want to love my neighbours better. I don't just want to preach better or, or to pray better or to understand the Bible better. I, I wouldn't care if I didn't have any, any more intellectual understanding of the Bible as long as I, I lived it out and had revelation in my heart about it. It's not about knowing it up there. It's about having it in your heart and living it out. So what is that most beautiful, beautiful of colour that God wants to bring out of your life? So to finish off, just three points, kind of summing up what I've said so how do we find our true identity? And it's a journey. The first one is that it's in Christ alone. If you're not a Christian, you don't yet know who you are. You don't know that you are a son of God with a heavenly father who totally loves you and wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you can transform your world and be a part of his great story. So it's found in Christ alone. And then secondly, it's by discovering who God is more and more and you'll discover who you are. If you don't spend time with God, you're not discovering who you are. You're kind of plateauing. You, you, you're stopping yourself knowing who you are because only with God's voice can he break open and reveal things in your life about who you are, about your dreams. And, and I came across a lady in Birmingham. She was um, almost 90 years old. And I saw on, these, on her wall these amazing, amazing 
pictures and paintings that, she, that somebody had drawn. And I asked her who drew, drew them, and she said she did. And they were honestly amazing, so perfect and, and well drawn, she could have sold them. And she didn't discover she could draw like that until she was 60. She'd retired, and one day she was bored, so she picked up a pen or a pencil and began to draw and began to paint. And she created these amazing pictures. She didn't know something of what God had unlocked, uh, had put inside of her, and it was unlocked at 60. So God has not finished with any of you yet about revealing something about you that he's put in you. This, maybe there's a creativity, maybe there's a in a tenacity that you, you're going to be awakened so you, so you can get through the circumstance that you're in. Maybe it's, it's seeing yourself in it through God's eyes for the first time. Maybe there's something about seeing yourself as God sees you that he's going to unlock. But it's unique to you. It's individual. But it's only spent, it's only discovered by spending time with God by being in Christ. And then number three is that as you live out the revelation of your identity with authority, you'll bring the kingdom to earth. And you continue to grow in your identity and, and creation's grown in its says for the true sons of God to be revealed. We need to know who we are. If we want to see people healed, we need to know who we are and that we move in that authority that God has given us. We move with confidence. And it's a bit like those kids we heard about at Energy. They, in some way, know a little bit about who they are because it's not yet being destroyed by the world around them telling them lies and, and for them making mistakes away from God. But something about God is in them and they know who they are and they can pray. You know, why wouldn't, they said about Dylan, why wouldn't, he, if, he, if he came back walking next year, we, we wouldn't be surprised. We'd be surprised, wouldn't we? We'd be like, amazed. And that's because our identity is probably more secure in God than often ours is. Because it's not yet been chipped away and damaged by the world around us. So who do you think you are? You're far more than you can ever believe or imagine. And there's so much that God wants to bring out of you. It's in Christ, it's through Christ. And it's for the world around us. Not, it's not just for us to keep. But it's to pour out of our lives. So I'm just going to play, we're going to play a song. And in this song is, is quite a reflective song. It's Oceans by Hillsong. And I just want you to maybe close your eyes, avoid any distractions. And I want you to think on that question. Who do you think you are? What is it that God has put in you? And let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart. It's only through the Holy Spirit working that this can be brought out. It's not through us trying harder or saying, today I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to, I'm going to be like this, I'm going to speak nicer. I'm going to be a, someone who just brings positive words all the time. It's hard to be something that you're not because only the Holy Spirit can bring that out, can make you like Jesus. And that's the true image that we're like God, we're like Jesus. So as you become more like Jesus, you're becoming more like your true self. That's quite amazing, isn't it? That as you become more like Jesus, you're becoming more like your true self. And I want to pray in a little bit during this song. So just reflect, just listen, let the Holy Spirit minister. And then I want to pray as well. So thank you guys.
Just let the Holy Spirit keep ministering to your heart, that thoughts come into your head that God is showing you about yourself. Let the peace of God come. Maybe there's people here today who, who don't yet know Jesus, because he's that starting point of discovering who we really are. He's that meaning for life that we are all searching for, all craving for. Only Jesus can fill that ache in our hearts for significance and for meaning and just while people's eyes are closed if if you don't yet know Jesus but you want to know Jesus this morning just just where you are I just want you to, to lift your hand so I'd like to pray pray for you this morning if there's anyone here who would want to give the life to Jesus say Jesus come into my heart for that first time just where you are just just lift your hands So we're, gonna, we're all going to pray this prayer for the, for the person who's put the hand up. We're going to all say this together. And it's a prayer to invite Jesus into our hearts. So I'm going to lead us and then I want you to, everyone to say it so we make that, that person feel comfortable. So Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you love me. And I invite you into my heart right now. I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. That you would speak to me about your love. You would give me an identity in you. Help me to live for you. I declare that you are Lord of my life. And I want to live for you. And I ask all that in your name, Jesus. Amen. And just, just where you guys are, just, just put your hand on your heart. Because that's where God does his deepest work, isn't it? It's not in our heads, but it's in our hearts. And I'm going to pray for you guys, for your identity, that God would awaken. In fact, if, if this is spoken to you this morning, if you want to say, God, I want, I want to discover more of who I am in you, I'm going to invite you to stand. Stand with me, because I'm standing for this myself. If you want to say, God, I want to, I want to know who I am more in you. I'm going to stand and make this declaration and this invitation this morning for your Holy Spirit to do a deep work. And if you know fully who you are, then you're amazing. Come and touch and pray for me later on, please. Because it's a journey of, of discovering Christ and ourselves in him. And I'll invite the, the band to come up. We'll sing a song at the back and the end of this. So, Father God, I thank you that you are our greatest champion, that you love us, that you're cheering us on, that you sing over us, you rejoice over us, that you're, you're pleased with us. We are your sons and your daughters, and with us you are well pleased. And God, in Jesus, we are, there is no condemnation. There's nothing that we've done that can separate us from your love. We just have to be unlike Adam, who, unlike, unlike him who hid, we want to run into your arms again. When we've messed up, we want to say, Father, embrace us. Love us again, teach us who we are, God, correct us, 
train us to be more like Jesus. Because we know that Jesus, only in and through you can we know who we truly are. And only as we know who we truly are can we move in more and more authority to see this world transformed. God, if we want to prophesy, we need to hear your voice. If we want to pray for people to be, to be healed who are sick, we need to be filled with your love and your compassion. God, we want to do what we see the Father doing and say what we hear the Father saying. So would you guide us, would you teach us, would you fill us fresh now with your Holy Spirit? God, help us to discover you more. God, give us a passion for your word. Lord, help us to, as we, as we read the word, for the word to also read us. Transformers, help us to pray, and as we pray, God, for things, would you, would you also say things to us and speak things to us that unlocks things in our life, God, that give us a confidence to be who you've called us to be. And Father, now as we worship, would you give us hearts to really receive your love for us, God? We want to connect with you in worship. We don't just sing songs because it's what we do, like some sort of Christian karaoke, Lord. We are singing because we want our hearts to be transformed by you, God. Would you connect with us? as we sing this final song and celebrate your goodness and the fact that in Christ we can find out who we are. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.